He's got nowhere to go. It's cold today. Whoever was his favorite was the one who was pretty much being molested. I was ashamed of it, but it's not something I'm ashamed of anymore. He didn't just ruin my life. He ruined all my brother's lives. He needs to be held accountable. Today is about a man who lived here in Hilo for a number of years named Jay Ram. And Jay fostered and adopted boys in California and here in Hawaii. And then he took them to his ranch where he sexually abused them and used them as child slave labor. Now many of these boys are- This is Joelle Castix. She's an advocate for victims of sex abuse. When you come forward publicly and you say that this happened to you, people look at you completely differently, not in a negative way, but in a positive way because they see you as the strong, brave survivor that you are. And she brought these brothers and their childhood friend together to find justice after decades of silence. We didn't even discuss it amongst ourselves. They say their adoptive father, a man once celebrated as a local hero, subjected them and many others to horrific abuse. And that from the beginning, state and social service agencies missed clear signs that something was very wrong. He was born Gary Winnick, but over the years, he's gone by the names Wandering Eagle and Jay Ram. Since the early 1980s, he's been a foster parent and has had dozens of boys placed in his care. Ram was seen as an eccentric hippie, a charismatic guru, a savior of lost boys. No one ever questioned his motives or methods, and he's never been convicted of a crime. Today, he remains at large. So today, we're on our way to Chico, California to meet with this guy who lived on Jay's farm back in the late 70s. And he was in his early 20s at the time. And he's been a little skittish, but uh, we're hoping that he doesn't back out when we show up. Um, But basically, we're just hoping to talk to him and get him to tell us about his experiences on the farm and just give us a little bit more of a picture of Jay. In the end, he agreed to speak with us, but asked us not to use his name. We also bleeped out the name of an alleged victim that he mentioned. So let's start with the first time that you met Jay. Well, then he was called Wandering Eagle, and this was in 1979 at the Whole Earth Festival in Davis. And at that time, I was on the weird raw food diet, and I had wheatgrass. And it was a a kind of a drumming session or something at night, and I was passing it around, handing to people, and, and Jay Ram was there and he looked like kind of a Greek god. He was drawn to Jay Ram's charisma, and soon after meeting him, moved onto a farm Ram had bought outside Chico. It was a commune, and uh, the name of the commune was Love, Serve, and Surrender. So it had a very Eastern uh, India bent, bent to it, very popular at the time. Train Maya Baba has come from India with a message to the West. Ram's adopted sons say he followed this man, an Indian guru named Meher Baba, who didn't speak for more than 40 years and claimed to be God in human form. Ram seemed to have similar ideas about himself. Jay Ram would say, what's mine is mine, what yours is mine. And that, 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 that would, would summarize the whole thing. Uh, I, I, th- I think that's what would summarize J. Ram in, 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 in total. Even with people, you know, they're, they're mine. So let's talk about when young men, yeah. young okay. boys started appearing on the farm. When do you remember the first time that you saw a young person there? Well, I think it was about 13 years old. Came up from Santa Cruz. Um, and uh, the guy that brought him up uh, the, in the pickup, he left, but stayed. And did that strike you as odd, or anybody else on the farm? The thing about that place is, is everything there is different than the other reality, and so the changes were were just ex- accepted. The, there was, there was no questioning. You just accept. There was, there was no questioning. You just accept. And I think there is a misconception there. I've been reading newspaper articles about Jay and stuff like that, and they call him homosexual, pedophile, everything like that. And he really, he's really not. Get, get, 
you turn left here. Okay. He would use sex as one of many controlling tools for people, a very deadly tool, the most deadly of his tools. I asked him to bring me to the former site of Love, Serve, and Surrender. Okay, we're, we're past it. This is it. It's in a stretch of farmland about 30 minutes outside Chico. There's not much. Everything's changed. The only thing that's here is these almond trees and, the, and these, these olives. It's very serious of crime that he's, he's, he's committed, you know. And I, I think, um, you know, just, just, you know, the last week talking, talking with you got me, got me thinking about that. And what is the crime that he's committed? Well, oh, sexual assault. Yeah, and that's, that's, the, that's the number one there, And is yeah. that something that you've witnessed with your own eyes? Uh, yeah, but you really wouldn't call it an, an assault because um, even that, uh, even uh, that was here, I mean, he was a happy 13-year-old. And there, 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 it wasn't like, you know, crying or anything like that. Uh, I, f I saw him over the years, you know, seven years later, and he, you, he just seemed, seemed fine. The, the, the only thing is, it, it, I, I think it's a type of abuse where it affects you deeply, not superficially, but, but, but deeply. You know, one of the things that made you hesitate to speak with us on camera was the fear of judgment from others who would say right. to you, you know, or just say about you, well, right. why didn't he do anything? Right, and, right. And what would you say to those people? Well, like I said, it was a whole life very controlling and manipulative and a lot of pressure. I heard many times, go with the flow, go with the flow. You see, so you, on, on the outside, we're, we're this altruistic society here, but in order to become part of this good thing, you need to go with the flow. In 1986, a woman who also lived on the commune wrote a letter to local authorities accusing Ram of having sex with a boy who lived there. And she warned that, quote, with this taking place, I can only assume there will be future victims. There was an investigation, but Ram was never charged. Around that time, Ram had been approved to be a foster father, and before long, he was being referred a steady flow of boys. Many, like Carlos Ram, had been fleeing horrific abuse, in his case, at the hands of his birth mother. So when I got home, it was just a beating. It was just a beating, being choked. I've had my eyes gouged. I've had my hands burnt in the stove. She would put the flames on when she found out like I was stealing pencils or clay or something. She would put my hands in the fire and just leave them there. And um, she would smash them with the rock, you know. Was, and how old were you at the time? This is from the age of six all the way through like 10 years old. Five, six years old, man. Ever since kindergarten, preschool, you know. I remember the first time going up there and uh, I saw all these boys, different nationalities, and uh, I was like, wow. It's like they could do whatever they wanted there, and you know, I was like, wow, that's you know, cool. We have a cool dad here. You know, my mother has always been one to fall prey to, you know, various gurus and, you know, religious figures, you know, that may or may not have anything uh, substantial to offer. And so the story of this guy doing something different may have appealed to her at some level. So he was like the self-styled rehabilitator. Rehabilitator, uh, long hair, smooth talker, had the Eastern religion shrine in his house with the candles lit all the time, smell of incense is everywhere. Yeah, he, he played the part pretty, pretty well. So how did Jay first come into your life? Foster home, so. And how old were you at the time? I was like, I think five, six. So were you the youngest one there? Mm, yeah, I was the youngest one there at that time. Mm -hmm. well, I didn't have a dad before, you know? Mm -hmm. And now I see the little pictures of me, mm -hmm. I start crying.
you know, just thinking of it. In the summer of 1988, Ram left Love, Serve, and Surrender and moved his boys to a more secluded property on the big island of Hawaii. He would live there for almost 20 years. We've come to the big island to check out where the boys lived and just to get a better sense of what their lives were like. We're also hoping to talk to some of the adults that were part of their lives, but no one has agreed to speak to us yet, so we're gonna keep our fingers crossed and hopefully we'll be able to get in touch with someone. This is Ram's old property. It sprawls across acres of rolling hills covered by sugarcane and fruit trees. After buying this land, Ram got to work growing things. And by all accounts, he was good at it. And he put his boys to work helping out. The local newspaper published several stories on how Ram was rehabilitating troubled boys by teaching them farming. One quoted a state social worker named Rosalind Viernes, who oversaw the adoption of four of Ram's boys. The boys have blossomed under his care, she said. He's a real good influence. Despite this questionable assessment, Viernes has risen through the ranks of the state child welfare department. Today, she's a supervisor there. She declined our repeated requests for an interview. The creek where we are right now is just a stone's throw away from the house where the boys lived with Jay. And looking around in the middle of this beautiful rainforest with so many areas to explore, it's a no-brainer. Any kid would find this a paradise. From the outside, it looked like paradise. But Josiah Allegro says he knew something was odd when he first met a few of the brothers in this secluded surf spot and started hanging out at their home. There were all sorts of rules. He was running it like a, um, like a home for boys. Okay. And it was but not in a good way. Did you get a sense that it was like a family or it was more like that they were staying there and that Jay was like in well, charge? Well, they, they called Jay dad. Uh, they, he was their dad and they thought of each other as brothers. It was a family, but it was kind of a strange, strange interactions. Like they would pick on each other uh, and, and hate each other all the time. It was just, it was bizarre, I'd never seen anything like it. Ram's adopted sons say that by then, he had created a bizarre sort of hierarchy for the boys, something right out of Lord of the Flies. He referred to his favorites as snoots and called the rest louses. Snoot status tended to be conferred upon the younger ones. They were more easily manipulated. And so if you were a special snoot, you got to sleep in the loft with Jay. If you were a louse, then you slept in the hole, as Jay called it. And you got sent downstairs, and it was dark. Everyone hated it downstairs. While snoots got special treatment, they were also forced to give something in return. He started talking to me about how in other cultures it's okay that men, you know, touch their sons or their, their younger male relatives in, uh, in intimate ways, and that that was a natural human thing. And he was always very careful to say that, you know, because of the rest of the society is so close-minded and, and terrible that you can't say anything about this. Whoever the special snoot at the time was, he would get him to lure the, the other boys in and kind of get them comfortable and into the whole idea. And so what Jay would do is he would masturbate the, the boy and then after the boy was ejaculated, then he would have the boy lie in his stomach and then he would hump his rump. Uh, and that's what Jay called it, humping rumps. We were all into the beach. We wanted bodyboards, fins, you know. I gave into it. I, I spoke with him about, you know, I wanted a bodyboard, I wanted fins, uh, I, I, I wanted things. That's when he asked me, you know, why don't you come up? Come up tonight to the loft when everybody's asleep. Let me hump your rump, you know. Um, there's nothing wrong with that. After that incident, it, it totally uh, made me think about what was going on in that house. And, and what the younger ones were going to go through or already had gone through, you know? 
This went on for years, and the brothers say Ram encouraged them to bring new friends home that he could prey on. A lot of times when I couldn't take it, that's what the long walks were for, that's what the drugs were for, you know, to help me get through it. And there were several instances where I just wanted to jump off that bridge, Hakalau Bridge. It's about the 16 miles north of Hilo. And that's the beach we always used to go surf at. And, you know, just walking on the edge of that bridge, on the very edge, and looking down. Carlos says he and others had been afraid to come forward. But we obtained records showing two other boys did report allegations to the Child Welfare Department as far back as 1989. There was a police investigation, and once again, Ram was never charged. And Rosalind Viernes and her department kept recommending Ram as an adoptive father for other boys. Then, in 1992, a nine-year-old boy came forward with a new set of accusations. His name was Zane Dittman, and he had been placed with Ram as a foster child by Catholic Charities. A judge issued a warrant for Ram's arrest, and suddenly the curtain was lifted on the Ram household. Or at least, it seemed to be. So this is where Jay's boys went to school, and they appeared to everyone else to be just like any other kids. And even their closest friends really had no idea what was going on with them at home. But everything changed in October 1993. That's when, for the first time, authorities intervened. The boys were pulled from class and taken into custody by both the police and social services. Ram's son say he had coached them to call if this ever happened. I used the phone and I called him and said, hey, something's going on. I'll be there right away. Hands up the phone. I don't know what's happening, you know what I'm saying? I'm scared. So I want to take off running in the cane fields, you know? And as soon as I go, like, Officer grabs me, slams me on the wall, and handcuffs me. You know, throws me in the van. You know, and, uh, and as we're leaving in the van, here comes Jay flying around the corner. The boys were eventually brought here for questioning, but no one spoke up. I think I was 17 at the time, and Jay coached us what to say. You know, to say that, you know, you come over and you have a good time, nothing like this ever happens. And I remember going to that deposition on video and lying to the camera, saying, oh, that, none of that stuff ever happened there. And I feel terrible about that because that boy and his father didn't get justice. Meanwhile, Ram's friends and associates were writing letters to local newspapers defending Ram and calling Dittman and his father liars. Eventually, Dittman recanted, and in June 1994, the charges against Ram were dismissed. Now, after all that, not only were the boys returned to Jay, but the lieutenant who led the action to rescue the boys from the home was slapped with a lawsuit by Jay himself, which was ultimately settled on his behalf by the police department. Until now, these were the only people who tried to help the boys, and they were punished for it. We reached out to police Lieutenant William Silva, who led the operation. He's retired now, but he says the settlement prevents him from speaking about the case. So today we're just outside of Honolulu, and we're on our way to meet the fifth brother. And he has kind of a different story than the other guys, because in this whole weird Lord of the Flies scenario that Jay had cooked up, he was at the top of the food chain. So it'll be interesting to hear how that situation was for him and his perspective on things. You do it like this. How many bumblebees are there? This one is and that one is. This is Rajan Ram. Like some of his brothers, he kept Jay's last name, but isn't really sure why. He lives here with his wife and six-year-old son. This is when I was already smoking all day, every day. What year was this? Uh, 8990. Okay. This is uh, Carlos. There's Josiah. And here's my class picture. Look like a normal guy, but a lot of anger in there. Whoever was his favorite was the one who was pretty much being molested. And for me, it, it was since 12 until about 16 and a half. 
I was pretty much the biggest asshole there, and I would dish out punishment anytime I wanted. And if my brothers even looked at me wrong, I would shove them to the ground, I would punch them, I would kick them, I would choke them, um, and I would be able to get away with it. Because you were higher up? Yeah, because I was Jay's uh, quote-unquote favorite at the time. And when was the last time that you had any kind of contact with Jay? Um, I confronted him late 2006. He said, that's not what really happened. You, you're just assuming things. It's not really, it wasn't really like that. And I told him, you know what? I know what happened. I know what you did to me. I call him a fucking faggot because uh, that's what he hated being called. Uh, everybody knew that. How has your experience with Jay affected your life as it is now? Oh, it's been horrible. I've been to prison, two felonies on my record. I'm not able to, uh, you know, help anybody, especially children, you know, like, that were hurt like me. I can guarantee that what he did all those years, he didn't just suddenly stop. He's just the worst kind of monster there is out there, and I really hate him. He didn't just ruin my life, he ruined all my brother's lives. A friend had called a 911. All of Ram's alleged victims have suffered, but no one as badly as Zane Dittman. He's the one who reported Ram to the authorities back in 1992. He was later accused of abusing a 10-year-old boy himself, and in 2008, blew himself up after a police standoff. But were there any red flags in the 26-year-old's background? It's been about 20 years since they left Ram's home. Where you at? And now Ram's boys are seeing each other for the first time as men. I'm by the baggage claim. 20 years since I've seen him. Think about 20. My stuff's still bottled up. I haven't, I haven't exploded yet. No, me neither. When a psychologist, she just told me I'm like a time bomb ready to explode. I'm yeah. like, yeah, well, that's why I'm here. Oh, no. Sorry I had to meet you like this, man. <laughs> Come on in, have a seat anywhere you want. Oh, man. Hey, hey man. God. <laughs> oh my God, look how damn big and tall you are. You too. Yeah? Oh. Hey, Jack. Uh, yeah. How you doing? Last time I saw you like this. Yeah. <laughs> I think he's that sick that he thinks he can win this. Oh, because yeah. he won everything else. The state of Hawaii has opened a two-year window that allows victims of sex abuse to file claims for old cases. Matt and Rajan wanted a way to hold their father accountable, and they reached out to the victim's advocate, Joelle Castix, a survivor of priest abuse herself. They did so many things to try to get justice, and time and time again, they were turned away. And so, I mean, I don't think that they really believed me that, that we could find them the kind of help that they needed and that, that there would be an attorney who would take their case because unlike cases that you see in, like, if for instance, in the Catholic Church, there's no money in it. This is a case that simply is the right thing to do. And so it was really important that they find an attorney who cared and who would just take the case just because of its moral value. The more pressure that can be applied, the better the possible outcome is. Um, I know Tampa PD uh, has them on their radar. I know the FBI has them on their radar. Um, both of them have, have called and asked for information and we've shared it with them. Castix connected them to Mike Reck, an attorney who's represented hundreds of victims of abuse by Catholic priests. So let's go through, just so I've got a list of, of people who could be, you know, victims who could have rights, witnesses who may... These men say they're speaking up for all the children whose lives were ruined by Ram. What about Michael and then uh, Joe? 
Joe was the youngest one. Yeah. When did Joe get there? When he was eight? Mm -hmm. All right, what about Roy? He was abused. He was, he was, yeah, he was abused. I mean, I was there. And this went on for another 15 minutes. Somebody remember Larry? Larry from Kentucky. What about John? By the end, the brothers had listed no fewer than 20 other potential victims. Scott is another person you can talk to. He was originally on board with us. Rec and his team started digging for any trace of Ram, and they got a tip that he had been living in Saipan, a tiny island about 120 miles north of Guam. Frankly, I didn't even know where Saipan was. I had to look on a map. Um, and it's really far out in the middle of the ocean. And if I wanted to hide, uh, that's a good place to go. Um, people reached out to us from Saipan and essentially said, hey, we think that the person you're looking for is here. We think he's living in this house. We think there are uh, potential victims with him. And um, that was our first real lead. And then he appeared back uh, on the mainland US. And they're out. Rex team traced Ram to the town of Odessa, Florida, in the horse country outside of Tampa. That's where they served him with the lawsuit. We went to Odessa to find Ram's home, and when we got there, left messages on his cell phone. But he never called us back. So we waited in front of his gate. When he saw us, he bolted. He's got nowhere to go. Let's go to that. And so we followed him through the streets of Odessa, trying to ask him a few questions. And after chasing him for more than 20 minutes, he pulled into a parking lot, and we finally thought we'd be able to interview him there. But instead, we were met with a sheriff's deputy. Ram had called the cops on us. Police interviewed our producer and cameraman, and then questioned Ram and three young men who had been in the car with him. We didn't learn who they were until a few weeks later when we got a hold of the incident report. According to the report, they were Ram's foster sons, who were put in his care between the ages of 8 and 13. They told police Ram had never abused them. We tried one last time to get Ram to speak with us, but he refused. Local police conducted surveillance on Ram's home after our encounter, but they didn't find anything unusual and dropped the investigation. Every one of you said to me, we want some accountability, we want some justice, and we want this not to happen again. And that is the purest motivation that's possible. Um, and I still don't know what the end result is gonna be. I know we found this guy, and I know we're gonna get our day in court. I think he's, you know, by all accounts, a very smart guy. He's got a good lawyer. He's going to be doing everything he can. Don't lie to us in her face. I've sat across the table from a lot of really bad men before, and my experience is that they lie when they need to lie. Right. They tell the truth when they have to tell the truth, and they're caught, right. and they have their own interest at heart. I wouldn't expect this to be any different, but we'll do it, and however it goes down, it goes down. <laughs>